Hey, how's it going? So today we're going to be taking a look at my top 15 cards for Corset 2021. I'm predominantly a standard player, so I won't be taking other formats into too much consideration. I love Commander and Draft 2, but I think those formats are so different that they need their own top 10, top 15 list. Uh, and remember, this is just my opinion, so if there's anything you disagree about or you have any different ideas, let me know in the comments. Um, if you enjoy, please drop a like and there'll be plenty more M21 uh, content on the way. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of that. Plenty of cool deck ideas and stuff coming, I'm really excited for it. And yeah, now this list isn't just the cards that I think are the most, like the single most powerful. Power level was a big factor in making the list, but some of the cards earn like bonus points or bias points, I guess. <laughs> just because I'm really excited for them or for like a potential synergy they might have or a certain place they might feel in a deck. So I'll start with a few honorable mentions and these are all cards that I don't think are particularly powerful, like I don't think they're going to be tier 1 meta warping cards or anything, but they're all super fun cards and I'm a really big fan of all three of them for different reasons. So, so we've got Rin and Seri, Brash Taunter and Teferi's Tutelage. Um, it's great to see dogs get a creature type, all hounds have now been changed to dogs, so for example like Cuneros will be a dog now, it was a hound before. And yeah, it'll be really interesting to see if a dog, a cat, or even a cat dog, cat dog, <laughs> if a yeah, dog cat or cat dog deck can become a thing at some point in the future. I don't think they're very powerful at the moment, especially not dogs. Cats are getting there, you've got Kahira and whatnot, and there are lots of cats in Arcoria. I don't think it's too powerful, but they're getting there. Um, dogs pretty brand new. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they can get there in the future because I think Wizards will be printing a lot of more high power level cats and dogs now because everyone loves cats and dogs. Well, you at least like one of them usually. <laughs> and um, so yeah, I think they'll be pushing them a bit in the future. This set's got things like Pack Leader, Feline Sovereign and Selfless Savior. They're all great cats and dogs that have been added as well. Even if Rin and Seri never see play in Standard. I'm sure they're going to see a lot of play in Commander till the end of time because everybody loves cats and dogs. And then Brash Taunt is pretty much a red Stuffy Doll. And while Stuffy Doll being colourless might seem like an upside because it can then be played in any a deck of any colour combination, I don't think it matters too much here because most decks that you want to be playing a card like this in, you're going to be playing red anyway because you want, you want damage-based sweepers and effects like that. So in Standard... You want things like Deafening Clarion or Storm's Wrath, so you can not only deal with your opponent's board, but also deal the damage to the stuffy doll and start pinging your opponent down. So you can remove your opponent's threats and start ending the game. I don't think it's an insanely competitive card, and the, the decks that I want to play it in aren't going to be tier 1 or anything, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm super excited for that. And then we've got Teferi's Tutelage. I love Meal. I love that they've made Meal a keyword now. I love Sphinx's Tutelage, if you guys remember that card, and Teferi's Tutelage is a very similar card, so super keen to play this thing and empty some people's libraries out. And yeah, with the honourable mentions out of the way, let's jump into the list. So at number 15, we've got Rada. Rada, Heart of Keld, 1 and a red and a green for a 3 mana, 3-3 three, three elf warrior, legendary creature Rada. Um, as long as it's your turn, Rada, Heart of Keld has first strike, and you may look at the top of your library at any time. You may play lands from the top of your library. And then it has a mana sink for six mana, including one red and one green. Rada gets plus X, plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of lands you control. This is a card that has a lot of raw and obvious power, but I'm not actually certain it's going to be enough. If you look at the three drop slot options we have at the moment, we've got things like Cruel Spellbreaker, which has Riot, Bone Crusher Giant, has a removal spell stapled to it. We've got Annex, which gives you board wipe protection. We've got Phoenix of Ash, which has haste and a recursion ability. Lovestruck Beast gives you two bodies, and one of them's huge. Like, And Bone Crusher Giant and Lovestruck Beast are all, also aren't rotating for quite a while. And the current meta build of Gruul is the Adventure build, which you use Edgewall Innkeeper to draw cards off your adventure creatures like Bone Crusher and Lovestruck Beast. So while Rada does give you card advantage, allowing you to play lands off the top, has a solid 3-3 first striking body, which is an ability that I think is 
quite underrated a lot of the time. And then it has that really powerful mana sync for the late game. Some really obvious power there. I'm just not 100% sure it will see all the play in the world, but... I do really like the card, and I think it was too powerful not to mention, but yeah, that's why it makes it in. Number 15 here, just scraping it in. Then number 14, we've got Discontinuity. Discontinuity, 3 and 3 blue, so 6 mana for an instant. As long as it's your turn, this spell costs 2 and 2 blue less to cast. Um, so if you cast it on your turn, it's just 1 and a blue, 2 mana. And it says, end the turn. So when you end the turn, you exile all spells and abilities from the stack, so... Not a card I plan on playing a lot personally, but I think it's quite powerful. So it's a pseudo extra turn spell with the flexibility of being able to play it on your turn for two mana as a counter spell. Like, that'll come up. It won't come up heaps, but because it exiles all spells ending the turn, you can technically use it as a counter spell. So say you've a scenario like this. You drop your Planeswalker, you have your two mana up, and your opponent goes to Growth Spiral. You can pay the, play this for two if you want, and the turn, their grass spiral is counted. So that's probably not the best example, but yeah, it, it will come up every now and then. So it's nice that it has the flexibility, but obviously mainly a six mana um, pseudo extra turn spell because you do let your opponent untap isn't quite as powerful as just a straight up take an extra turn, but six mana in standard, that's still a, a pretty good card because like we had the seven mana one, Nexus of Fate recently, which was an insanely annoying card, so we'll see if this one can be just as annoying. Maybe it'll be in a Wilderness uh, Reclamation deck, just like that one was, but that one shuffled into the library so you could keep looping them, so I don't think this is quite as scary as that, but I still think it's a pretty strong card. Obviously also can go into a lot of janky decks. Um, you can use it to negate end of turn triggers like Chance for Glory, for example. So you take the extra turn from Chance for Glory, and then before your end step, when Chance for Glory, that last bit of text where it says you lose the game is about to trigger. Instead, you pay the two mana for this and the turn, and then you don't lose the game. So, you, yeah, just stuff like that. It, it's a very cool card. Might see some play in some meta decks, and I think it also has some application in, in some more janky fun decks as well. So, yeah, discontinuity in at 14. Number 13, we've got Subira Tulzidi Caravana. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but hopefully. And Subira is 3 mana, 2 and a red for a 2-3 legendary creature, Human Shaman, with haste. And it also has pay 1 generic mana, another target creature with power 2 or less can't be blocked this turn. And it has a second ability, 1 and a red, and tap Subira. Discard your hand until end of turn whenever a creature you control with power 2 or less deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So you really want to be building around this and making the majority of your creatures 2 power or less and having the ability to make any of your creatures unblockable in a deck like that if they're all 2 power or less is actually quite insane. Like We see t like cards like Tin Street Dodger which is just the 1-1 one -one with haste that can make itself unblockable see a lot of play and being able to give other creatures that ability is pretty crazy. The card advantage ability is great too. Later in the game, say you have even just one other creature, you've emptied your hand, this is the perfect mana sink, you can pay the one to make the other creature unblockable, then you pay the two to draw a card, because you've already emptied your hand, discarding your hand isn't a downside. Yeah, you really want to be playing this in a low to the ground, aggressive deck where you're just dumping your hand so that discarding your hand isn't too much of a downside. And yeah, not to mention the board stall scenarios where you have like, say, five creatures on board and you flood it out a bit. You've got like seven mana or something. You can sink all of your mana into making all of those creatures unblockable and just draw a whole fistful of cards. And a 2-3 with haste isn't the best body in the world, but it's alright. So yeah, I, I think this thing can see play in certain mono red decks or maybe even like a Boros um, low power deck or something. It'd be cool if we got like Mentor of the Meek or something like that. If we had a low power matters deck, that would be cool. And we've got Cavalcade of Calamity at the moment as well, so might slot in there. It itself doesn't... If it had one power, I'd probably like it even more, so it could go in a deck like that, but it itself won't trigger the Cavalcade. But making things like your, like your Scorch Spitter unblockable is pretty crazy as well, so yeah. So yeah, that's number 13. Then number 12... 
Storming Entity. So, Storming Entity is 3 and 2 blue, 5 mana for a 3-3 three, three creature elemental. Doesn't sound too good from that, but says this spell costs 2 and a blue less to cast if you've cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn. It has flying, prowess, and when it enters the battlefield, scry 2. So, I've always been a sucker for non-creature spell matters type decks like prowess and is it drake style decks like that we have a few months till arclight phoenix rotates so this might be able to appear alongside that once it does rotate though i think this is a great almost replacement it's not an exact replacement they are quite different but yeah i think it'll appear in de in those types of decks with things like sprite dragon i don't think it's quite as powerful as arclight phoenix as arclight phoenix is recurrable can keep coming back from the grave maybe you can get two three maybe even four at once, but I think this is comparable as it has the ability to be cheated into play for a cheap cost if you cast an instant or sorcery that turn. You don't need to cast three like the Arclight Phoenix, so it's going to be easier to trigger. Cheated in for two mana. Scry two upon entry is actually quite strong. While this thing doesn't have haste like the Arclight Phoenix, the one thing it has over the Phoenix is the prowess, meaning it can be a huge attacker. And it can also be buffed sometimes enough in response to a, a damage based removal spell to survive it. Prowess is a really strong ability. Scry 2 is great. 3 3 Fire for 2, obviously going to be great. Yeah, I'm really excited to give it a go. And yeah, if you've been watching the channel at all, you know I love Sprite Dragon. Obviously, going to love playing it alongside this new big birdie. Number 11, we've got Heroic Intervention. This is a reprint I've been hoping for for quite a while now, and I'm sure. A lot of commander players can agree because it has risen in price quite a lot recently. Heroic Invention is 1 in a green, 2 mana for an instant, permanence you control, gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Originally from Aether Revolt, first time it's been reprinted. And yeah, I'm, I've always just been a really big fan of this. It gives green creature based decks that don't have blue mana, so say like Mono Green, Gruul, Selesnya. Gives them a way to technically counter a board wipe or a removal spell for only two mana. So in decks that do have blue, obviously, you already had the option to use like a Dovin's Veto or something to counter a board wipe. But yeah, this is pretty much a counter for that. Also going to save you from removal spells, like target removal spells. Um, and it's all your permanence as well. So your enchantments, your lands, if that ever comes up. If Agent of Treachery was still in the format, that might have been pretty cool to be able to save your lands. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just a great card. Three minutes of fairy doesn't rotate for another few months, so it mightn't be as good until Tef is gone because he shuts you off from playing this at instant speed, and that's the only time you want to be playing the card. So after he rotates, I think this card will be a very handy sideboard option for any green-based deck. Number 10, we've got Chandra's Incinerator. Chandra's Incinerator, 6 mana, 5 and a red for a 6-6 six, six creature elemental. This spell costs... X less to cast, where X is the total amount of non-combat damage dealt to your opponent this turn. It's got Trample, and whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, Chandra's Incinerator deals that much damage to target creature or planeswalker that player controls. Currently in standard, mono-red decks are a bit more combat damage focused, mainly because of Embercleave and Annex. But this card, I think, really incentivizes going for a more non-combat damage kind of burn strategy. We have some really strong burn cards in the format that aren't seeing a lot of play at the moment, like Skewer, Slaying Fire, Risk Factor, Shock, and then Light Up the Stage slots right in there too. You've got the potential to get this thing out on turn 3. You go Shock, Skewer becomes 1 mana because it, uh, Shock triggers the Spectacle, and then you've got 1 mana left, you've dealt 5, and yeah, you get a 1 mana Chandra's Incinerator, and that's not actually that uncommon, but yeah, I think you're mostly going to be getting this guy down on on turn 4 or 5 or something. And yeah, then being able to turn all your burn spells that you're hitting them in the face with to also be removal spells for their creatures and planeswalkers is great because a lot of the time if you've got a burn spell in hand and they've got a really problematic creature or something, playing burn, it can be really tough to know whether to hit the face or to kill the creature. But this just takes that decision making out, hit the face, it's like a questing beast. It hits the face, takes the planeswalker out. But yeah, you can do it with creatures too, it's great. Um, and a 6-6 six, six trample is insane as well, so yeah. I don't think it's as overpowered as a lot of people kind of think. Like, I've seen people saying it's going to be banned and stuff, which I think is ridiculous. I think it'll be a lot more powerful in older formats. Like, modern, you can go Rift Bolt turn 1, Lightning Bolt turn 2, 
you've already dealt the damage and you cast this on turn two. So I think it's going to be a lot stronger there. But here, you're most likely going to be getting it turn four or five with the the occasional turn three. And it's going to be insane if you get it on turn three. But it also dies to most most removal, non-damage removal. Like Against red, it's going to be great. Big 6-6 six, six blocker and stuff that they can't kill. But yeah, I don't think it's as overpowered as a lot of people are. I've seen people freaking out about it, but... I still really like the card and I like that it incentivizes a different approach to mono red. Number nine, we've got Joriel Monvuli Recluse. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right again. They've got some pretty cool names in here. Well, two mana, one and a green for a one, two legendary creature, human druid. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a two, two green cat creature token and you can pay six, four and two green until end of turn, creatures you control have base power and toughness XX, where X is the number of cards in your hand. So we already have some nice draw two payoffs in the format, and this is another excellent one. The downside is that it means we have to go into Teemo rather than just blue-red, which all the other ones are in. But at least we have the Ketria Triumph, so the mana shouldn't be too bad. But creating a 2-2 two -two cat whenever you cast a, something like an opt on your turn, or we've got Cathartic Reunion now, or an instant speed thrill of possibility and your opponent's turn draws you two cards. And yeah, creating a cat whenever you do something like that is insane, and that mana sync is great too, because you're going to have a reasonably full hand when you're playing a deck that really revolves around card draw, obviously, so often going to be able to make your creatures nice and big. I don't think the mana sync matters all that much, it's mainly playing it for the 2-2. The but yeah, alongside like Iron Crag, Pyromancer, um, Improbable Alliance and stuff, I'm really excited to play a deck like that. And yeah, as I said, mana shouldn't be too awful because we've got the Ketria Triumph, but I do wish it was blue or red, but what are you going to do? Number eight, we've got... Number eight. We've got uh, Arch Demons or Arch Demons. I don't know, Arch Demons? Arch Demons Vessel. Archdemon's Vessel is one mana, it's one black for a 1-1 one, one creature, human cleric. It's got lifelink, and whenever it enters the battlefield, if it entered from your graveyard, or you cast it from your graveyard, exile it. If you do, create a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token with fly. Now, I know this is just an uncommon, and it mightn't be all that powerful, but I really like the idea of playing this card in a deck with Call of the Death Dweller, and four main deck Lurus. There are also cards like Revival and Gruesome Menagerie that work really well with this, but yeah, just getting this thing back from the grave as a 5-5 just seems really, really cool. The fact that Wizards were planning on having this in the format with no companion nerf, like this thing in a deck with pre-nerf Lurus as the companion would just be insane. So I'm really glad um, it wasn't in Arcoria. I'm really glad they've <laughs> nerfed the companions now because, yeah, having Lurus as your companion, getting this back whenever you want as a 5-5 would be pretty bonkers. And also the new little dog, the Selfless, selfless Savior or whatever it was called, um, that thing would have been insane in a Lurus deck as well. And, I mean, you can still play Lurus, but thankfully you have to play, pay the 3 mana to get it into your hand, so yeah, not going to be anywhere near as strong. So I'm glad they nerfed that, but yeah, I still really like this card. And yeah, I think I like small guy reanimator decks. So usually reanimator decks, you want to be bringing back huge creatures, but it's cool that I think the standard format at the moment, we've got enough cards in Revival, Call of Death Dweller, Lurus, Grissom Menagerie, that um, yeah, a reanimator deck where you're bringing back little creatures is a thing. And you've even got the new, the white totem. I don't know if it would, it, it exiles the cards, so it doesn't synergize with the rest of them, but we might be able to work out a deck where where that fits in as well. So yeah, excited to play like a reanimator weenie style deck with a card like this. Number seven, we've got Watcher of the Spheres. Watcher of the Spheres, two mana, one white and one blue for a two, two creature bird wizard. It's got flying, creature spells with flying you cast, cost one less to cast. And whenever another creature with flying enters the battlefield under your control, Watch of the Spheres gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Now, I really have always loved flying decks. I love Azorius Flyers. And the current one in standard desperately needed another playable two drop to play alongside Skycat Sovereign. M21's given us Shacklegast as well, which might be another nice new option for the two drop slot. 
But I think this one is probably the way to go. The cost reduction ability isn't going to come up an insane amount because you're playing a lot of one drops and Skycat Sovereign obviously is one blue and one one white and this reduces everything by one generic so not going to reduce any of those cards but it will make Imperian Eagle and Hanged Executioner cheaper and I think you really do want to be playing Hanged Executioner because it has the two bodies so it's going to give this thing plus two plus two to attack in and also two bodies for the Safara and the fact that it starts as a 2-2 two -two and pretty much has prowess for flyers is great because it'll be swinging for like three four sometimes five in the air sometimes more like it because you're reducing the cost of hanged execution and sometimes you turn four double hanged execution you're swinging in for six like uh, it's a really cool card really cool ability also opens up some pretty insane play lines with safara so say you go turn one one drop this on turn two turn three you can cast hanged executioner for two mana meaning you have four flyers because you have your one drop the Watcher of the Spheres, and your two bodies from the Hanged, Exe Hanged Executioner. Um, and then you have one mana left over to tap your four flyers and cast your Safara on turn three. Not many decks, I don't think, can really beat a turn three Safara. So I'm, ex I'm super excited for those nut draws, but yeah, just super excited for this card in general. I love, I love flyers. And yeah, I think we've got like Rally of the Wings, a nice Lord in Imperian Eagle, we've got some decent one drops probably would have liked if they printed maybe one or two more powerful flying one drops but i think that might push the deck a little bit too far so yeah i think the deck i don't think it's going to be tier one I, I do think it's going to be pretty decent and i'm excited to play it and i'll definitely be doing a video on that number six we've got veto of the dusk rose veto is a three mana one three two and a black for a legendary creature vampire cleric whenever you gain life target opponent loses that much life and we've got a mana ability of three and two black so five mana creatures you control gain life link until end of turn so i think veto is a great reason to go ors of in a life gain deck rather than the mono white Indulging Patrician and Silver Smoke Ghoul are some nice new cards as well that incentivize going all of. They're not quite as powerful as this guy, but some reasonable looking cards. Yeah, but turning all of your life gain into burn, like pretty much burn, is insane. It's so easy to gain life incidentally, like without going down on card advantage or anything. Like you don't want to be playing cards that are like one mana gain for life. You want to be playing cards that are going to gain your life as the game progresses, like even just the Healer's Hawk. Every time it attacks in for one, you're adding an extra damage because you're gaining one life and you're dealing one. So, And that activated ability, the ability to give you all of your creatures lifelink is going to end games really quick. Like if, if you've got a few creatures on the board, they attack in and you deal damage for every point of life that you gained. And note, it says creatures you control, not other creatures. So it does give Vito himself lifelink, even though it's just a 1-3, a but going to get in a bit more damage. Yeah, I think it's just a super cool card. Uh, I really like the direction they've gone with this one and it'll be interesting to see if life gain decks play black now for cards like this or if they'll stay mono white for things like Linden and Heliod. You can still play Heliod in the Orzhov version but you're not going to be able to turn it into a creature as much so maybe mono white's still the way to go. Maybe this card won't even see all the play in the world, but I really like it. And either way, I'll be giving him a go. And yeah, that's Vito, number six. Number five, we've got Hooded Blightfang. Hooded Blightfang is a three mana, two and a black for a, a one four creature snake. Uh, it's got death touch and whenever a creature you control with death touch attacks, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Whenever a creature you control with death touch deals damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. So in my Porky Parrot death touch video, I specifically said I wanted more creatures that had the death touch for planeswalkers ability, like the tokens that the four mana of Raska from War of the Spark creates. I think it could almost be its own keyword, but we'll see if that ever happens. Um, but yeah, this thing gives all of your creatures that ability, so I'm super happy about that because Death Touch Tribal and Porky Parrot Death Touch were great against creature-based decks because easy to ping uh, creatures down with Porky Parrot or to use things like Domri's Ambush on your Death Touch creatures to kill their creatures. But because they didn't have Death Touch for Planeswalkers, your matchup against control decks was nowhere near as good, but the ability to kill planeswalkers now and adding one damage to all of your attacks 
because it says whenever a creature you control with death touch attacks, each opponent loses one life. So you're adding a damage to all of your attacks, you're going to end games a lot quicker. So this makes death touch travel a whole lot better in every matchup, but especially against the control planeswalker style decks. And yeah, I'm extremely excited to play death touch travel and porky parrot death touch in the upcoming format. Making lords for keyword abilities like this is also a great design space that I think wizards can delve into a bit more. You would have thought, it's, it's something that seems really obvious, like you'd think lords for keywords would be a thing, but it's something they've only really like looked at recently, I guess. Like in the last set you had the Menace Raptor and you had the all of the uncommons that um, cared about certain keywords and stuff. Yeah, I think it's a really cool design space that wizards can definitely keep in mind for the future. Number four, we've got Conclave Mentor. Conclave Mentor is a 2 mana 2-2, two, two, a green and a white for a creature centaur cleric. If one or more plus one counters will be put on a creature you control, that many plus one plus one counters are going to be put on that creature instead. And when Conclave Mentor dies, you gain life equal to its power. So this card is basically a Selesnia Winding Constrictor, which is a pretty great thing to be. It only triggers off plus one counters and not just counters in general like the Constrictor did, but... I think the Constrictor was always mainly used in plus one counter decks anyway, so I don't think that's too big a deal. And yeah, I'm, ex I'm just super excited to play this in a deck that cares about plus one counters. We've got things like Stone Cold Serpent, Pell Collector. It might be time for Hawatli's Raptor to shine. I've always really liked that card. A two mana, two, three that proliferates upon entry is just great. Yeah, and we've also got another really cool new card for the deck in Bastry's Lieutenant, which is our number three on the list. Just had to follow the Conclave Mentor up with the Bastry's Lieutenant <laughs> because this card goes into, the da into that deck so perfectly. I'm so excited to play the deck. Bastry's Lieutenant, four mana, three in a white for a three, four creature, human knight, it's got Vigilance and Protection from Multicolored. When it enters the battlefield, put a plus one count on target creature you control. And when it or another creature you control dies, if it had a plus one counter on it, create a 2-2 White Knight creature token with Vigilance. Now, Protection from Multicolored is huge, as we've seen with Stone Cold Serpent, particularly against Teferi, because it means it can't bounce it. But it's, it's great against a lot of cards, obviously. It means you're going to be unblockable against multicolored cards like Gruul has like say they have like a Zertar Goblin and a Gruul Spellbreaker you can just block them all day you can get through unblocked if you want yeah protection from multicolored is just insane and you've got four or five worth of power and toughness some of that being the plus one counter that you can put on either it or another creature genuinely want to be putting it on another creature I would imagine but the flexibility is nice to put it wherever you want it because if you put it on another creature it's kind of giving that 1-1 one, one power haste, so that's why I would assume you'd want to put on another creature, but if you can make this thing a 4-5 protection from multicolor with Vigilance, that's great too. And that last ability is just insane, so we've got, got really nice board wipe and removal protection in a plus one counter deck, but I think it's still a decent option in non plus one counter focused decks that want a 4 drop like this, um, because even if just putting on itself, I think it might be I think it still might be worth it because yeah it's already like above the curve protection from multicolored vigilance is nice upside and then yeah if it dies or another creature with the plus one counter dies you get a 2-2 knight so i'm in love with this card when i'm playing creature based decks obviously uh board wipes are one of my biggest enemies so having something that helps you combat board wipes i'm a super big fan of and yeah I love Bastry's Lieutenant. Super excited to play it. Now, number two, we've got Eugene, big old Yugen. Yugen the Spirit Dragon, eight mana for a seven loyalty Planeswalker Yugen. Plus two, it deals three damage to any target. Minus X, exile each permanent with converted mana cost XLS that's one or more colors. And the ultimate, minus 10, gain seven life, draw seven cards, put seven permanents from your hand onto the battlefield. I'm not particularly the biggest fan of this card being reprinted into the current format as Ramp is insanely strong at the moment and this just gives those type of decks another excellent Ramp payoff. I think the power level of Yugen is too undeniable to leave it off the list though so even though I'm, I'm not happy about it, <laughs> I think it's, yeah, it's an insane card, gonna see a lot of play, might even be one of the more played cards from the set. You ramp into this as early as you can, minus to clear the board, and then you just take over the game from there. Not to mention the fact that if you can stick this early on a non-threatening board, say they only have one creature or something, 
you can just start plussing it to deal three damage. Like they have the one creature, you kill it, and you you start plussing this thing, and you can get to the ultimate, which is almost certainly going to win you the game. Like draw seven cards, gain seven life, drop seven permanents. Yeah, that's insane. I'm also really scared of how well this thing synergizes with Nissa. Like Yugen's minus exiles all colored permanents, and lands aren't actually technically colored. So the lands Nissa turns into creatures are actually colorless. So Nissa can ramp you into an Ugin no problem, because obviously Nissa helps you ramp. And then Yugen minuses to exile everything, and you get to keep the Nissa lands. And then you're extremely unlikely to lose from there. And yeah, I'm pretty scared of that. Like say. You turn two growth spiral, turn three Euro or something, turn four Nissa, and then you have the turn five Yugen, and yeah, that's that's terrifying to me. <laughs> you can get this thing out even earlier as well. Like if you go like turn one a boy or grazer, which I don't know if Ramp Dex will be playing it, but if you go turn one a boy or grazer, turn two Euro, that means you have five lands on turn three for your Nissa. So you're getting a turn four you can so yeah. Um a bit scared, a bit scared, and we do like as I said, ramp's just so powerful and there's just and there's just so much redundancy in the deck, like so many different ramp options that it's just you're gonna get this guy out early very consistently and yeah. Maybe it's not as strong and as scary as I'm thinking, but I'm a bit concerned at the moment, but we'll see how we go. And at number one on my list, I've got another reprint in Scavenging Ooze. So Scavenging Ooze, two mana for a 2-2, two, two, one in a green for a creature ooze, has the activated ability of just one green mana to exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, put a plus one counter on Scavenging Ooze, and you gain one life. So this is an insane reprint. This card gives grave graveyard hate for the matchups you need that in. And then gives you life gain and a big blocker for the aggro matchup. So it makes it just one of the best sideboard cards of all time, I would say. And in standard, I think it's going to be main decked in a lot of decks as well. Like things like mono green, the plus one counter synergy decks. Like, And yeah, Ooze has just always been an extremely strong card. And continu it continues to see play in older formats. And yeah, I don't see that being any different in standard. The ability to exile Euros, which is just one of the most played cards at the moment, to exile a cat at instant speed if you have enough mana. You can pay the one to exile the cat, then they, in response, will sack the food to get the cat back. You pay another one and you you target the cat again, so then the stack, you'll actually end up exiling the cat before they get it back. So it's going to be great against cat oven decks, which are obviously also really heavily played at the moment. And then, yeah, as I said, life gain and a big blocker against aggro. Yeah. Scavenging Ooze, excellent card, such a great reprint, and yeah, I'm really excited to play it. I love my, my green creature based decks, and yeah, this guy's gonna go into a lot of them. And so yeah, that's my top 15 cards for Corset 2021. You might have noticed there wasn't a single Planeswalker on the list, and that's not that I think they're awful. Um, I don't think any of them are just insanely powerful. Like, I think. None of the Planeswalkers in the set stand out as obviously, like, busted just yet, which I think is a good thing. Like, I don't think we have, like, a new Oko-level walker. Um, Teferi's probably the, the hardest to evaluate because of its static ability. Makes him very unique, so who knows, he could end up being broken. But from what I can tell, we don't seem to have anything, anything too crazy here, and... Um, yeah, the set in general seems to be a pretty fair power level, actually. I'm pretty pretty happy with the power level. I could be wrong. Maybe we're going to end up banning five cards from it, but <laughs> nothing jumps out as, oh my god, this thing has to be banned. Um, but only time, will, only time will tell, I suppose. So. so yeah, if you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. Plenty of M21 content coming. I'm going to be playing heaps of decks with... All the cards I just mentioned, really. Pro probably not going to be playing too much Yugen or Discontinuity, but the rest, <laughs> the rest I think I'll be playing a lot of. So subscribe for that, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.